it's interesting. It's interesting. So taking you back a bit now, then goes to like the roots. Where where did cricket begin for you guys? So both of you, when was it like the you started to think, okay, what is this sport? I'm interested. Come on, Grace. <laughs> um, mine was I've got two older brothers and both of them played cricket I feel like that's just sort of everyone's story is that they've got older brothers or older siblings that played cricket but they didn't play it to a very good level but mine was more so I was at school and played a bit of quick cricket when you're at primary school and got sort of seen by one of the like Lewisham district coaches and then got invited to that and that was all boys and it just sort of it grew from there and then uh, when I was, I think, seven or eight, got first got into Kent under 11s and then have play, literally have played Kent ever since then. Mm. So, my, yeah, I'm yeah. mine and Gibbo. So me and Gibbo have known each other since I think you were nine and I was eight. And so, yeah, so Gibbo had been in the under 11s for one year and then I came in Um so our stories are very similar to be honest I've got two older brothers and we just played in the garden um and then at school my primary school didn't play but um I just went to this fun day I thought it was a fun day at Sutton Valence School in Kent and then sort of realized it was a trial having absolutely no idea never played it before but I mean I played other sports so I could catch and throw and stuff like that and then yeah just from there I got into Kent under 11s and then yeah, been playing with Gibbo ever since. So uh, <laughs> lucky girl. Anyone that knows anyone that knows Kent knows that if you get into the under eleven girl side through a, a number of factors, mainly the coach's enthusiasm, you tend to stay in cricket. There's not an option once you're in the under elevens to go yeah. and, and find another sport. Don't you know, are well and truly I think women's cricket, the especially from Kent, obviously that's what I've been involved in, they put in so much time at age group levels and that just sets you up um yeah in the long run especially under 11 under 13 like those coaches sometimes they've been volunteers um they put in so much and yeah it's, a, it's obviously a really positive experience and then it sets you up for life really do you think that's do you think that's uh changing now do you reckon there's more opportunity because obviously you, you come from backgrounds where your brothers are playing but do you reckon there's girls out there who have zero uh, cricketing in their family that now there's more potential avenues I guess to get into well the Kent, Kent under 11 seems to be the, the place to be at the <laughs> yeah I think 100% like now at school it's the main girls summer sport instead of rounders um, it's in the GCSE curriculum I know that's a bit older but I mean I would say that most girls growing up now would see cricket as one of their main three sports probably with hockey netball maybe a football as well um yeah so it definitely would be more opportunity and stuff for like chance to shine and then companies like top cricket academy um buzz about cricket <laughs> for girls professional, there, are so the many, professional there are so many small sort of companies that aren't that would have been just for boys but now would be for everyone it wouldn't even matter if you were a boy or a girl and i mean that's what i've seen coaching is and you guys would probably agree with me that the younger the girls are the sort of relatively they're better than if a girl has started a bit older but just because they see cricket as the norm and they've yeah. grown up watching it playing it so that's what I've seen working that, at that's, school. That's, that's the biggest thing for me in terms of coaching um, boys or girls boys traditionally have seen more cricket so yeah. whether, whether that be live cricket I with their family or on tv um yeah girls traditionally don't or haven't watched as much of it and I think the the benefits of what we're seeing of what's happened in the last few years and the big names and the big competitions that are coming out isn't just the fact that um, the standard of cricket is actually being proven to be of an equal level um, it's given the opportunity for for other girls to actually see potential icons playing the sport that they want to to achieve at and want to do and you know there, there's always been that kind of that balance between the chance to shine opportunities and the and the you know the ladies have competitions because the transfer from that into you know recognised cricket is quite a jump and quite a leap. But when you've got the like I say the opportunity to, to actually see it firsthand, that leap doesn't seem too big. It seems that actually that's a challenge that I want to you know take almost. Yeah. Yeah. 
I didn't realise I would be so political then, but oh. <laughs> so you've been so serious today. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm impressed. Knows? I'm who impressed. Knows? It's that coffee. I don't know what's in the coffee. Uh, uh, just, you, yeah, if there is a coffee sponsor out there, I'm still looking for that endorsement. <laughs> Every single episode that we've what what sort of coffee vibe is it? Is it an espresso or is it just? No, th- so today this is an Italian roast that I've actually put through into a um, little cafeteria thingy and then oh, very nice. and I've actually used a little bit of single cream rather than milk today because let's face it, I'm in isolation. I can do what I want. The, what's what's the, what they called the coffee and coffee anado? Something anado. The, the ones that Dave's great. obviously not a coffee person. I'm not a barista. No, I've never, I never do coffee. Uh, uh, see, I'm, I'm a hot chocolate. I'm no, I, did, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. And a friend of mine, um, he he basically bought too many coffees. He's like, oh, do, do you want this? And I was like, oh, what is it? He's like, oh, it's a cafe, it's a latte with um like vanilla toppings. I was like, oh yeah, sure. And I'd have been 23, 22, 23, so not like a kid. And I was like, oh, okay, I drank <laughs> it. <laughs> No, no, what I'm saying, but the end of the story is I basically had that one. I was like, "Mm, yeah, I I fancy a bit of that. I had six more that day. And then, yeah, yeah. oh, yeah, six more that day. It's a proficionado I was thinking of. And then from then on, I'm now now a proficionado, apparently. Thanks, Dave. There you go, mate. That's a fancy title. We'll put that in the the bio at Buzz About Cricket. (laughs) Average part-time cricket, part-time cricket enthusiast, full-time badger, a little bit of a proficionado. But yeah, so... (laughs) So yeah, Buzz is to all of our 14, 14 followers at the moment, 14 subscribers. Buzz is desperate to try and get a coffee sponsor about that. So you never know who might be listening. But um, yeah, back to, back to the topic as it was. It's, it's interesting that you say about the route that people are taking. Because we was having a chat yesterday about, or sort of in a previous episode, about is the unconventional now conventional in cricket? So by that we mean back in the day what you were considered to be correct. So high front elbow, um, when you're batting, everything you've got to play most things off the front foot. So if there's a right and wrong way to do things. Do what do you reckon? Do you guys have a sort of thought on that? And what do you think the reason is behind that? Because we spoke about the likes of Majib and and all these bowlers from different countries and batters that have different setups and do all sorts of different things. Is it is it what's the reasoning behind? That's quite a broad question. Um, I think sort of seeing girls get into it when they're younger. Um, I do think that the sort of fundamental like basics of technique are there for a reason. I think if say someone was uh, so like sort of open in their batting stance, they, they probably can't access the offside. So I I do think there is um, definitely room to keep the sort of fundamentals like basics technique, especially batting, bowling, whatever. Um, But then I think with girls as well, you've, you've got to let them sort of explore their own sort of, way so when I'm sort of coaching I'll I'll just talk through or show the basics but then if someone does it slightly differently it won't bother me if they're able to play the shot or um, bowl it in the right areas I'm not too bothered what it looks like but I do think that the basics sort of skills and techniques of cricket are there for a reason and that's why they have been embedded for so long I don't know what you think Gibbo. I no, I agree with Tash like with the fundamentals I think in in any sort of any sport that you go to play you're going to have them basic fundamental skills which are the skills that the the, yeah the main skills that everyone will use regardless of how they use them everyone will use them and I think especially for me working in a school uh, and obviously like a PE department and doing cricket with girls that had never ever picked up a bat before some of them never literally never played before our focus for them is mainly just sort of get them hitting balls get them bowling balls like so like tash says everyone's actions different everyone will bat differently and have a bit of different technique as long for me as long as the outcome is positive for the girls then i'm happy but i i do agree with tash in the fact that there are the fundamentals and they are there for a reason they're what sort of scope and set like a level for us as coaches as well for then us to be able to go off on a tangent and work in different directions I think what you said Buzz before though what is really important is the more girls can see cricket on tv and see how Nat Siver 
bats or Catherine Brunt bowls, then they'll go in to say their first ever cricket session and they will have more of an idea. I think that is probably one of the key, like the key things that needs to happen is if girls can see more cricket and they see their actions or uh, batting setups, then when they get involved, they'll have more of an idea. So I think the more that girls can see other girls play, I think that is one of the most important things. Um, and they'll still have different techniques, but then they might have more of an idea and something to relate back to when they're actually practicing themselves. Yeah, I think, you know, you know, give a use of it, per, you know, perfect when you say about the success, about actually the, the result of what, what's happening. I think the reality is when when you're in a, a, a closed environment, in a, in a practice environment, in a netting environment, there's, a, there's only so much feedback a coach can give of going, oh, that was really good. That looked great. Well done. You know, it's 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 time for them to get out, play some more and actually feel that, you know, see them hit the gap, see it hit, you know, the, the boundary and then get that that intrinsic feeling, you know, that you, you, you only get when you're being successful at a sport. You know, I mean, you brought up Nat there in terms of her, you know, the Nat Meg or whatever it's called, you know, when she hit it through her legs. Yeah. That that in itself, that one shot kind of changed the scope of where um, you have to hit a cricket ball. You know, there, there doesn't need to be that high elbow. Oh, you've got to hit it through the covers. The game is somewhat slightly different uh, between the, you know, the the, the men's game and, and the women's game. The, the thing that I want to know when you're coaching girls a lot, do you do you pick up on anything different because of the slight changes in the game? Um, I think, well, sort of speaking technically, girls are much stronger at hitting to the leg side. I don't know, there might be a tennis or a hockey, in my school, very much hockey influences. So yeah, they're yeah. very good at sweeping the ball. And I think you can see that in the women's game, like a lot of girls and well, for myself, it's one of my go-to shots. And that's because I used to play a lot of hockey. Yeah. Um, so from the batting point of view, that, and I think the hardest thing is to try and get them feeling that sort of weird um, technique for them to hit on the offside. And I think that's when it comes back to some of the basic um, fundamentals of batting is really important. Um, but, and also I think coaching girls, one thing that's really important is what Gibbo said is a success rate. If they feel like they are confident enough to do it, whereas if they feel like, oh, I'm not really succeeding here, then they're quite, they're probably a bit quicker than boys to just sort of write it off. So I think the success thing is really important. If you can create an environment where they are having some failures, but also, but mostly successes, then they're more likely to carry on cho choosing cricket as their sport. Yeah. yeah. And it's one of those sports where you, it's a struggle at first, because it's going to, like you say, Faz, it's going to be so different. A lot of the skills they do, they're not going to have ever done them in any other circumstance. So like bowling is not a natural movement. No. You, don't, you don't pick up bowling naturally. You just have to work at it over time. Batting, like you say, there's you play with sweeps, reverse sweeps naturally through other sports and you can swing the bat cross batted. But that brings in you getting bowled a lot. And, and with a lot of players, that can lead to them becoming quite demoralised. I'm intrigued. So I was going to bring up the point and you've made it there. Um, how important did you find your background in hockey was for you being able to understand cricket? Or did you go? How, how did that transition happen? Um, well, I played sort of hockey and cricket sort of to the same sort of levels as I was growing up and I mean I probably was a bit better at hockey when I was younger but and probably getting a bit further in hockey but I just preferred cricket as a sport more so because of the diversity that played cricket um so different sort of people and from all types of backgrounds and I I much preferred that I preferred the environment I found it more of a team sport even though that sounds a bit silly because they were both team sports but you have more time sort of chilling with your mates on the boundary so I, that's why I chose cricket um, but hockey for me the first thing that was so important was the fitness I had gained from hockey taking that into cricket and into my fielding sort of agility wise and then yeah sort of just it then you could probably see that sort of my sweeps are my strongest area and that is probably come from hockey sort of without even thinking about it so yeah, and then obviously, Gibbo, what you played football, so that probably helped you yeah. in the as, as well. Yeah, I've never played hockey in my life until <laughs> I'm now working at the school that I'm working at and I have to coach it. I'd never done it. I went to went to state school. It just wasn't, it weren't, it weren't the sport where I grew up at all. It was, yeah, football, as Tasha said. Um, so for me, cricket-wise, a sweep is one of my sort of like last resort shots. <laughs> 
Yeah. I, I just can't. Yeah, it's just not for me. Whereas I prefer to go over the top, sort of like straight back over the bowler's head or sort of open, open myself up and go through the offside instead. And that's just, I think, obviously, because I've never played hockey, I've never really had that motion of playing a shot like that. So I'd never thought about it when I first started playing cricket. And it is something, yeah, I've definitely been working on. But it's like Tash said, the I played football my whole life as well. Um, and the fitness that you get from them sort of sports, because it's, it is continuous. You are continuously doing stuff, like regardless of what position you're sort of playing in, you are continuously running, continuously being aware. And that does, it does um, help with the cricket, like you say, with, agility changing direction sort of being aware in the field and stuff like that no it definitely is a so good that you both brought fitness because i think it's the what it is yeah. really one of the things that it, it's so it's forgotten about so much and it, it you know people just think about when they think about cricket they think about just a short bursts of energy and then a like for whatever reason a two-hour break with cucumber sandwiches that's still the stigma that you know <laughs> revolves around our our sport but it's... Like, can I just um I had quite a funny story here I asked so I said to the girls that I was coaching I said right what is cricket to you and one of the girls honestly the best answer ever put her hand up and she just goes it's the only sport where you can eat halfway through <laughs> and that's why, <laughs> and deep, that, and that's why we all play it yeah it yeah. was the best answer I just thought I had to say that because honestly yeah. it was hilarious it's brilliant no, we, we we, it, it is funny though like that that is that is what other sport <laughs> <laughs> do you literally like halfway through like should we just eat free yeah yeah let's just and eat the, the, the just incentive eat. as you go up if you get to the top level eventually you're gonna have lunch and tea so there's it's that incentive food. to get food, though, food, <laughs> food. It's, more food. So, it's brilliant i mean what more could you love it i mean yeah i'm really interested with both yourself Gibber and faz have you do you think the game's changing a lot in terms of the fitness expected of players. Do you think that there's been a massive switch from maybe the technical aspect to the more athletic aspect? Huge. I think if you can't if you can't field now and you're not you're not one of the best at your skills. So say you're not one of the top bowlers in the world. If I'm talking like <laughs> international county sort of hundred ball stuff as well. Yeah. Um, you will be picked over someone else if your fielding is on point and I and also if you're fit if you're able to run those twos back to back etc etc if you're able more so for the men's game if you can bowl long spells without and also from an injury prevention point of view if you yeah. can't if you can't stay fit then you physically can't play cricket so um and it doesn't have to be boring sort of running and monotonous sort of things it's it's being able to be agile and move in a sort of um position where you can hold your shape sort of fielding wise um but yeah I think it's so key now especially at a higher level yeah it's, it's, that, you got any that, it's, that, that? it's that mental side though as well isn't it it's that transition of where your physical uh fitness kind of as soon as you get tired mentally that's when the lapses comes yeah no I completely agree with what but what everyone's been saying um especially with the fielding I think talking sort of firsthand as well as someone that um, has played sort of in the like the levels of like domestic cricket when it comes to county, when it comes to the Super League that obviously finished last year and stuff like that, you can see that the development of people and you play with people you normally play against and you can see the difference that being a good fielder makes. You Like Tash said, you may not be the sort of top five in bowling aspects or in a batting aspect but if you're up there and then you are in top five of the field in that is going to be your route into mm. what the squad is and then you have the chance to work with the coaches to work with other players to develop that other discipline to then push yourself into that top five bracket yeah i think it's interesting you say that because I think the way the game's changing now, I think it will go even further towards like there is there's you need specialist fielders, but also actually if people can't like you say if they can't field, if you aren't athletic, you can kiss goodbye to representing to to go into a certain level because it the the way the like you say the way the game's changing now it, it's faster paced. If you are that unfit, if you aren't athletic, 
you will be left behind in the 100. There's, there's no two ways about it. You'll be gassed out after 10 balls. But it's, it's interesting you say, Baz and Gibbo, about it's not just training fitness of in terms of running, 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 running. Because actually, there's you need to be athletic. You need to be able to move well. And, it, and moving well isn't like a case of standing tall and running back to forward. It's being able to move laterally. It's being able to throw yourself. I think one of the most underrated qualities in being a really good fielder is bravery. I think the people that are brave enough, you see the amount of times people see a ball and they like, oh, just it didn't quite go for it. Like that's arguably what makes a good fielder someone that's athletic and brave, in my opinion. I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, definitely. You've got to be willing to sort of throw yourself about in the field, don't you? And I think once you get over that fear of maybe diving, especially when you're a bit younger, and you just sort of throw yourself into it, uh, no pun intended, but... Um, <laughs> then it becomes really fun as well. Like I think, um, yeah. so uh, Fran Wilson obviously plays for England. She told some, She told me something about a year ago that has, or probably two years ago, that was really stuck with me. When she fields, and she is one of the best fielders in the world, yeah. if everyone remembers her unbelievable catch in the summer. Um, yeah. She just says, I... So I'm in my position, normally point, and I say, right, from there to there, this is my goal, and it is not getting past me. So she might use the inner, inner ring or something like that, but she has this goal, and it, on the boundary, she makes it bigger, and she does not let that ball go past her if it is in her goal. Um, and I think looking at that as well, looking at it in different ways, it, it becomes really fun. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's how you got to make it. I, I think all of us, like, if even when we're at our sort of Kent training and we're indoors and we've got tiny little mats on like hard ground, but we'll be there, everyone, all of us chucking ourselves on the ground, like getting behind everyone, which I think is a good thing as well. You think one decent bit of fielding, one decent stop in the inner ring can change the whole game. Yeah. Oh, it's it changes catalyst. the complete, the yeah, complete atmosphere, the complete morale of the team mm. and everything like that. And then everyone is up, everyone's fiery, and that could result in a wicket and stuff like that. So it could cha literally change the whole game. And I think with what Tash said about sort of just sort of frying yourself into it as well and not being worried about um, getting hurt or anything like that, I think I've, I can relate to that quite a bit because after I come back from my knee, when, when I, my first knee, so <laughs> three years ago, <laughs> it's the first one, was done I'd done it in a club game fielding I went to turn and I, my spike stayed in the ground so my top of me turned and the bottom stayed still yeah which wasn't wasn't pleasant but because I'd done it fielding when I was coming back from that that was my only block bowling I was absolutely fine I was running in batting was fine turning when I was batting was fine as soon as I got to any fielding Anything that was sort of a meter either side of me, it was my only, it was my only block. And I was at training one day, and I just thought, I'm just gonna chuck myself. I was like, you know yeah. what? If my knee's gonna go again, it's gonna go again, <laughs> regardless of what I'm doing. Something's gonna happen. Go out of a bang. Chucked myself, stopped the ball, and haven't even thought about it ever since. Don't even care. I literally chuck myself anything, and I think yeah, that's quite an, that's quite yeah. an amazing thing because like psychologically, that can take. A lot yeah. of time yeah. for yeah. that. That is like the definition of just jumping the deep end of the pool. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. soaking yourself up and just going for it. Whereas a lot of players could actually say, "Now nah, I've got to kind of adapt or change how I'm going to go about playing the game to, you know, almost to to protect yourself. You know, with your inner self, your, your mind. So it's actually quite a brave thing to do. Go, I'm really psychologically not going to like this, but if it comes up all right, and which it has. Um, the I don't want to ask how you did your knee again. Hopefully not. <laughs> um, but that no, was I bowling that time. Every time you went back, it was the other knee that I'd done bowling. So <laughs> it's yeah, but like, well, on, on, on the fielding thing, I've always said from from a coach's standpoint, um, regardless of the batting or the bowling disciplines. If we're able to walk off the pitch knowing that we fielded better than that op the opposition, we're in a, we're in for a shout. You know, we've got a chance of winning that game. And it's for me the fielding element that gets forgotten so much. But I I I feel that it's neglected in a in a winter process when it comes to training, mainly because of the facilities and mainly because of the the, the time aspect that most teams struggle with. Um, but but the other thing as well is, I look at fielding and I 
you can kind of take a squad of players and everyone's on an even kill. You can kind of say, look, if, you can work on your agility. You can work on your speed. You can work on your actions. You don't need anything else for that. And it can kind of really bring the squad together. Like you're saying in those little competitions in, in the halls with those mats, when you've got one person willing to go, do you know what? I'm just going to go all out here. It sparks the entire squad off to go, I want a bit of that. And then it back, and then, then it does create that fun and that enjoyment and that energy that you kind of need within within a team. I think it's so important. I think people often forget that there's it's fielding isn't just fielding the covers. Like there's so many different aspects to fielding. Like I, I've pretty much accepted early on that I couldn't really move very well, and I still can't move very well. So my I said to myself, I'm going to make my hands unbelievable. So I just <laughs> well <laughs> could get the violins out. But I, I was like, right, I'm just going to stand and slip and try and train, my, train myself to take everything. And actually, that was the best thing I ever did, because not only do I not have to run now, which means I've got more space for food at tea, but also it means I can just, like, I've made that position my own. And now I can go and stand short cover, I can stand slip, and I can actually do mid-on, mid-off, long on, long off, because you're not doing much running. So as much as there's going to be people that can make themselves feel like into really athletic fielders, there's other sides of the game you can work on, make yourself really good under the higher ball. Someone in our team, Maxine, She's probably, she'll, she'll admit she's not the most athletic fielder. However, I, if a ball goes up in the air, I don't, I don't think there's anyone you girls would trust more under a higher ball than mainly because she just takes it like up here so you know she's in control. But yeah. it's, it's like she's, she's adapted and she's found a, a value for herself in the team. Um, but going on from that, I, I asked a question to give her a little while ago when we did a, um, a session and she came up with the best answer. I'm not going to get her to give the answer again. But have you got a role model in cricket? And um, and it, if you want to tell the people why what your answer was and why your answer was that no. you've got you've got a room full of aspiring young female cricketers that have come along and we've got Gibbo <laughs> here and we say right Gibbo who's your role model and I was waiting right. for found said, answer when, when you were growing up who was your favourite cricketer okay it wasn't who's your role model okay. Okay. that's a completely different now, question now say the answer when no. I was growing up so when I was ten eleven whatever I. My favourite cricket was Stuart Broad because I fancied the pants of it. <laughs> hey, yeah. Nothing to do with the actual cricket. I mean, he is an amazing cricketer, but that is when I was their age, when they were asking me the question, I thought, you know what, I'm going to be honest, I'm not going to make anything up here. His long it was, blonde, highlighted hair. It was, oh, yeah. yeah. The long white, yeah, the way he <laughs> yeah. just done it for me, you know. And that was, that was my honest answer at that time. I <laughs> know, oh, fair play. But have you got have you guys got a role model of, of sorts? Because obviously the game was in a different place when you guys were both growing up and you were younger. There probably wasn't as many standout role models in the game. Obviously we go we're going towards a different way. But is there anyone that sticks in your mind or not? I think when when you say about when we're growing up, obviously that when we were fourteen, twelve, like twelve, thirteen, fourteen was like over ten years ago and stuff like that. And realistically. The only uh, so much, sort of so well, we've been talking female role models because women's cricket wasn't as big as what it is now. Are sort of the role models that you knew within your county, and we were quite lucky to have the likes of like Charlotte Edwards, like Lydia Greenway, obviously Lindsay Askew as well, Susie who's come back to play now. Tammy was still there. Like we were lucky to sort of know that they're playing for the women, so we're able to look up to that and think wow there's six England internationals in that women's team at the moment like it's amazing it's like so we were quite lucky would you have anyone different first or uh I think I didn't really know about women's cricket when I was younger and I think it's so good that it's completely different now if you asked a girl who was 12 and an absolute keen cricketer she probably would say a female cricketer which is brilliant um as soon as I got in the Kent setup, mine was Charlotte Edwards, and because, and then as soon as I, so when I played my first game for Kent Women, um, as soon as I started playing, I have always had so much respect for her, the amount she has done for women's cricket, but also how she carried herself on the pitch. I was, I was a bit intimidated by her, but that's only because she was so professional and just absolutely loves cricket and I think it just really spurred me on I was like oh yeah I want to be like her she loves cricket she is amazing so for me it was Charlotte Edwards but only until probably I met her um yeah. but yeah. She, 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 was, she was like the face of it wasn't she she yeah. was the face of women's cricket and you could almost argue that 
the, you know, the foundations that she laid, it, she, it was a constant. It was just a constant reminder that the women's, thing, you know, the women game is there. The women game, you know, we want more. We want more media coverage. We want more funding. We want more opportunity. We want more girls to play it. And it was always through, you know, it was that's the first person, the first face that I, you know, would recall when you kind of have no real idea or, or understanding women's cricket, but you knew who Charlotte Edwards was. Yeah. So to have her kind of in your dressing room or around where you're training must have been an unbelievable experience. She was also so down to earth. Like she was the biggest joker in the changing room. Like she absolutely loved to be involved. So she had both of those sides. She was so down to earth, but then she was also an unbelievable professional. So um, yeah, no. So she was. She's just brilliant. Like the women. Like. The women's game is so lucky to have had her because I don't. If she hadn't have played and done what she had done, I don't think it would be the same to what it is now. To be honest, she, she was a pioneer. Her, she. her as a captain, like being able to play under her, she was a captain that she was. She is the best captain that I've ever played under, and I'll happily say that. No, no matter. But she no. did not play under me in the uh, T20. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> after Tash, sorry, after Tash. Not quite, the right, not quite the same calibre there. Yeah. <laughs> she was a captain that she wouldn't tell you what to do. She'd want you to figure it out yourself. Yeah. So yeah. she was, I think she. Did, everyone would say she'd help everyone grow as a player, especially me. I wouldn't be the player that I am now without having, having Lot as a captain for me, purely because you'll get some captains and younger girls have come into the squads and stuff like that that will sort of do everything for them they'll set all their fields for them and they'll do this whereas lot wanted you to figure that out she wanted yeah. you to sort of make a mistake in a way for then for you to be able to go actually no this is what i should be doing and i think a lot of us especially like faz myself megan belt as well i know that lot helped meg a lot with her bowling with her fielding with her awareness and i think having that captain that can do that and like what she's done then she's obviously gone on with southern vipers and played for them become a coach and now with the southern brave as well like she is like you say she is women's cricket isn't yeah. she in a in a hole it's fantastic I mean, to hear to hear about like to get an insight into what made her such a good captain because and i think a lot of people especially captains are afraid to expose their team's flaws and, and actually to have that level of trust that you we're all in this together here I'm going to give you a platform to grow your skill set. I'm going to give you the opportunity to show me what you can do without having that, that fear of failure. And I've actually, I believe that that's one of the most underrated traits in a captain. When you look at, you talk about having, what does leadership look like? That is a, a, a quintessential example of, of great leadership. So, I mean, you're going to say something, but I think, I think as well, sorry, before, in terms of stake, a lot of players I've noticed when I spoke to, to girls that are in the game that said about role models, it's someone that they've come into contact with someone that they've actually like you guys have said there someone that you've actually met and or played under or played with that becomes your your role model but hopefully we're going towards a time now where the amount of cricket that's being shown on tv will leave us in a place where that girls will have role models before they've even met them there'll be there'll be people that they idolize certain players and i've seen that already have you guys before i go on to buzz have you guys had any experiences where you've been like i'm actually I, it's a bit sobering to see like yeah i'm a role model for someone or like, if you had a moment where you sat and gone, crikey, I've sort of not made it, but look where I'm at with the game sort of thing. Yeah, I think um, I had one um, moment that um, Helen Fagg, who works at Kent as well, sort of, uh, like, made me aware of, is that they were, they done sort of like a little review with some of the under-11s and under-13 girls, like a little questionnaire thing and stuff like that. And this young girl that I had coached previously, when they said, like, who is your role model? Who has sort of got you here today? She actually wrote my name. And, you know, when you sort of, like, Helen sent it to me and I was a bit like, no, surely not. Like, that can't, <laughs> surely not. Not me. That can't be right. But, like, she had, yeah, she had actually wrote my name. And it just, it makes you think, we do it for a living. We have, we see so many girls, so many boys sort of passing through the sort of, age groups and everything like that but to have sort of see that and think oh, actually something that I might have said or done with her has made her think yeah actually I want to continue this I want to pursue it even more is sort of one of like the best things that you can sort of get as a coach hmm. that's fantastic point yeah I mean I think you you, you, you look back at 
when, when you think about yourself, it's very easy to also remember the the bad thing, the negative thing. So when I, when, you know, when you go back to a co- everyone remembers a coach or a teacher saying something quite negative. And I think it's one of the things that kind of always grounds me that the words of which you're putting and what you're kind of imprinting onto these younger players, it's exactly the point that you just made, Gibbo, can, can live with them for a very, very long time. And it can shape the direction of where they want to take their their skill set and their their cricket you know or even just their their transferable skills because i think we also forget when we're coaching people that they might stop cricket at a specific age and then take that skill set onto maybe flip it across onto hockey or they might go onto tennis and vice versa and it it is a it is something that as a younger coach i'm quite conscious of but i i, I get you know do you think there's a there's a difference between a a male coach and a female coach within your game and about how the language and the communication is used with younger you know younger athletes younger players I don't I think I think for girls growing up it is really good to see female coaches Mm -hmm. um I'm a big believer in that and I think that's I I I don't really care if a coach is male or female but I think just for girls to see that um see the girls involved in cricket whether they're players or their coaches is so important because I think if I was younger well I, I played for the boys and I always played for the boys when I was growing up but I think if I had got to ha- if I had had a female coach at some point it might have not been the whole time but for a year or something like that I think it would have really um, made a difference I think just being able to see sort of older females sort of doing what you love as well I think I think it is really important I think the coaching sort of techniques and how they deliver it I'm not really sure that there is probably a difference there but uh, I don't know you you might see it differently Grace but I think just seeing females involved is important yeah I think like you say about the the actual coaching techniques I think when we were younger we would there was sort of a big gap between sort of a male male coach and a female coach purely because there weren't that many female coaches yeah. around like when me and Cash were going through the age group so it sort of had to be male whereas yeah. now that gap is it's nothing there is no gap now women and men coaching wise there's people that are on on levels and I think the likes of sort of like the especially in Kent like Lucy Armon and mm. uh, JJ who works with us and then obviously myself Faz like ADR do bits and bobs I think, especially with Lucy, I think she's got the under 13s, as she does. Yeah, yeah, she's with 13. That, that sort of age mm. is a really pivotal and important age to have a female role model yeah. in sort of whatever you're doing, whether it, even if it's not in sport, if, if, if it's at school, having someone that they know, because I think females are more likely to go and talk to another female about specific things, and that's just how it is they don't want they feel more comfortable doing that which is completely fair and especially around that age where there are going to be developments of lots of different things for females having that sort of core in that coaching team there I think is really good like really good and then obviously as they move up like for me I've always been coached, other than when sort of like the Kent women, when we had Lid and when Lot used to do it a lot, when it was, when women's sport again wasn't as big. I've always yeah. been coached by my, like men mm. in all my teams, all the Super League teams, all, be, all been men. The Kent age groups, all been men. So yeah. I think it's no difference. I wouldn't, I would not be against being coached by a woman at all because if they've got the job, they're experienced enough yeah. to do it do you know what I mean like yeah. now it's not like people volunteering people actually interview for these jobs now and stuff like that if, if they've been interviewed and they've gone through all of that and they've been rewarded with getting the job then that's the, that they're I, I don't think I don't it. think we're I don't think we're going to be far off having a female coach head coaching or assistant coaching in the men's game you know, and yeah. exactly and like exactly what you exactly what you're saying it it, it falls back down to um, who is best, who is best for the role, and who is, and and the criteria of what whatever the team is looking for. If that coach, whether they be male or female, come across with the the correct game plan or the correct process of what you know that team is looking for, you know, brilliant. It's just I think it always falls back down to that 
that initial stigma and it comes down to that communication of uh the the, the gender men not men versus women but you know, do you know what i mean that how, how people you know perceive things and how they talk about other things and i just think the the beauty of what <laughs> women's cricket's doing at the moment away from just the game itself it's breaking down all the aspects of our sport everything's becoming a little bit more level yeah and i I think the role of a coach has changed slightly now as well and and actually we need to take into consideration each player as an individual and not as a as a as a player you've got to look at the person before the player and in that sense there's there's no reason why a man or a woman should be better at doing that job it's it's whoever's best at maintaining those relationships and and actually getting the best out of someone you, you, there's, there's no reason why the correlation between players playing their best cricket is when they're happiest in themselves and relaxed and, and enjoying the environment. So you can't, like I say, there's no way of quantifying that other than who gets on best with that group. On the topic of, of coaches, girls, who's has there been a coach that you've worked with in the years or, or coaches that you've had experience to that you sit and go, do you know what? They really resonate with me. Like they've told me something, or I really worked well with them, or I liked. And what was it about them that you particularly liked, if anyone? So my so when I got into the England Academy, the coach was Lisa Kitely, who is obviously yeah. now England's coach, but she was my first female coach. Not that it had anything to do with it, but I always really loved her coaching style because if you worked hard, you earned her you earned her respect. If not, then you maybe didn't. But she was harsh. But then you could also really you could have a normal chat with her as well. I think it's having that balance where, yeah, they're your coach. They sort of are your boss but you can also have those sort of down-to-earth chats with them as well so she was one and then um when I was at Loughborough I worked with Sal, Sal Briggs who um is now coach of Tasmania who was also brilliant and she sort of had similar ethos which I think is not necessarily the people it's those co- that coaching ethos where they're you have to earn their respect by working hard um and making sure they know that you're doing everything you can to be the best player that you can be. But then yep. you're also able to have those honest chats and sort of just have friendly banter with them like they are sort of your mate. So I think it's having both of those sides to a coach, which I find really important. Yeah, I'd go with, I had um, a man called Jeremy Greaves who uh, works closely with Surrey. He works with a lot of the... Uh, boy stuff at Surrey I think he does the academy there now as well and he for the first two years of the Super League was um, our coach alongside uh, Richard Bedbrook and he for me I'm quite a outspoken person sort of say it as it is sort of would say it not not to hurt people's feelings but I'd rather say we didn't Honestly. play well here yeah. rather than sort of being like well that bit was really good I'd rather be like that weren't good enough and mm. everyone that's played with me will know that. Like, that is how I am. And Greavesy was exactly the same. And he'd come in, and I had so much respect for him because he'd said that. And he's come into, obviously, a group that is obviously just girls when it comes to the Super League playing playing team-wise. And he has the courage to actually stand up and say that and not, not think about if he's going to hurt someone's feelings, but think about what needs to be said for then us to all work out on it for the next game. And yeah. I, I really respect that alongside um, Bedders, who has helped me throughout when I, even when I was in sort of England uh, pathways and academies, he was my bowling coach then. And then to be able to play under him at um, Surrey, he's, yeah, he's been really sort of pivotal in me being the player that I am now. Yeah. No, I've, I, it's interesting to hear that in terms of like building that rapport and building and having that respect. I think the key things is that you want values as a group and, and values in a coach. And I think one of the key things is from what you guys are saying is in terms of you've got to set those values out early on. And if that's honesty in some groups works the best, you need to be willing to have those hard conversations with people because that's how you earn their trust. So honesty, trust um, and transparency, I think is, is is key from what you're saying there. But it's fascinating how you've got di- like different people stick with you for different ways. Like it may just be one thing that you've done helping you for a difficult time in, in, a, in your game or sort of, like I say, it's fascinating. Is there anyone with you, Buzz, that you potentially have responded well to that you've worked with or, or learnt from? The, the, coaches, the coaches that I've grew up with are, are the people that rewarded hard work. 
they could actually sit they could just see that regardless of like, everyone wants to win deep down and i know i know you shouldn't say that as a as a coach and you know in terms of in terms of what i do now I'm head coach of the under 15 girls you know i would be lying if i said i didn't want to go out and win every single game of cricket i yeah. don't think i put the forefront of what i want to you know label myself as or the team as but what i try and do is is say if we work harder then every single you know every other team that we're playing we're going to have a chance of, of winning i think that's kind of been instilled in me from from good coaches that the coaches that i've not kind of got along with are, are those who almost feel like they've they've earned their respect of yourself straight away you know they just kind of walk yeah. in the room there's, there's a little bit of everyone's got an ego but it's almost like i've, I've been here i've done that i'm going to tell you to do something now just go and do it and how people respond to that rather than actually having or just seeing the people that you know they, they they work they work every they get into that they get into a session they sweat they they you can see them physically and mentally training on their different aspects and, and and their game and i think that that sort of that sort of bond can't be then broken between a player and an athlete and like what gibbo's saying when you've got when you've gone through that from a coach's standpoint it becomes easier to critique a player or critique a squad because that trust is already in place it's, there's no there's no malice or there's nothing there that's uh you know b- being said just for the, the sake of it it is being right the reason why we haven't achieved what we've wanted to achieve as a team today is simply because of a b or c and that you you listen to that information rather than going oh this idiot's talking again so yeah. it's just yeah for, for me it's always been the, the coach that's willing to to see past the the obvious yeah i think that's a good point i mean if i'm I'll briefly speak on my from from my perspective i think it's about creating a blueprint and a value within a group where you know what your best is you strive for that best and you know if you've been at your best regardless of of how things go if, if I, I believe when i with, with that with the group we've got at the Kent women that we, if we play to our best, if we play within our capabilities, we'll win every game. But I want us to be judged on that blueprint. I don't want us to be judged on, I don't want us to, to go out there and, and I want us to play a certain way that we are comfortable with playing and we enjoy playing and have the results through that way because that's ultimately how you get that honesty and that trust is we say, right, this is what I expect from you girls. And then the, likewise, the squad says to me, this is what I expect from you, Dave. And this is what I expect from Nick and a coaching team. And once you've got that, you, you then have those intrinsic values and you can judge yourself against those. So rather than going, right, we won the game, but we played terribly, and sitting there going, well, we were brilliant. Because, well, no, you can win a game by playing terribly. But if you go out there and play with the right blueprint, you play in the right manner, you will win games and play to the best of your ability. And there's so much more value in that, I think, as a coach. And that's what the best coaches have. Like, I, I, I like, interestingly, that my favourite coaches I've ever worked with are people opposite to me. So I, I like Dex the most that I've ever worked with, Mark Decker, because he was a complete opposite to how I was. Doesn't, doesn't really care too much for cricket. You know, honestly, the girls will probably tell you. As soon as he gets out of a cricket environment, it's, I'm switching off. Whereas me, I live cricket. He's very quiet. And, and, and what he, when he says, when he u- uses his words well, he says minimal words, but when he speaks, you know he's talking. And actually, he was, he's a very laid back character. And, and I learned so much from him. I know, you, obviously, I let the girls speak on it in the set, but I learned loads from him. He's shaped a lot of how I like, would like to be considered as a coach now. And that's purely because he was a complete opposite when I first started with him. I was this, I was this end, and he was that end. And I thought I took so much learning, but I, maybe he took learning from me as well. And that's why I, like, I respect him because he was far my senior, far more experienced than me. But he was willing to learn and see the, the skills I brought. What well, obviously, you girls, you played under him last year. Would you say that's a fair assessment? Yeah, I think when he spoke, you listened. He also has this thing where he speaks really quietly, so you have to really listen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I said that to him once, and he he does it for a reason. You yeah, have to listen to him because he speaks quietly. Um, but yeah, no, he was someone that you could have a normal chat with, but then, and then he wouldn't be shy at telling us if we played really badly and we needed to do better. So he had that those both sides to him as well. Yeah, it was, it was fascinating. Go on, give over. You got anything to add to that or? No, I think we probably covered it. Like what, like what Tasha said, like he was, he's, he's, he's lovely. And I think how he handled himself, considering that that sort of role that he had was sort of the first role that he had that was just sort of female and was sort of catered to one specific team. Whereas before, obviously, he works a lot with like, the, obviously, the second team and 
the academies and all like the boys age groups and stuff like that it was sort of like the first time he was sort of limited to just one female team and I think he was he was worried about that and like Dave said he was he was asking people he was asking people like Dave asking people like Nick obviously even asking our advice to help him them develop which I think is great when you see someone like Dave said who is far your superior ask him for sort of advice and for help to see then that they still want to sort of develop and to grow their sort of coaching philosophy and stuff like that is yeah it's, it's that, vulner- like it's that vulnerability as a, as a person as well because you know at the end of the day whether it's a you know people get so caught up they're saying oh, he's a coach or she's a player well no they're just two people <laughs> they are literally just yeah. two people that's all coaching is it's just dealing it's dealing on a on a on a person-to-person basis it's finding out what makes that person tick it's finding out what how that person wants to react you know that that comment about speaking quietly that is a t- that's a teaching method it's an, a fantastic teaching method when everyone's getting so aggressive and loud around you being quieter drags everyone it's, and it's a fantastic tool to use it's but, interesting that you want you know, i was just terrible. saying you don't learn those things you don't yeah. you know you you, you know you, you, you well sorry of course you learn those things but you don't just develop them you you literally have to speak to people you have to go around and you have to be willing to open yourself up and go right i'm in a situation that i don't quite understand i'm not going to pretend that i understand it i'm going to learn and that's that's being a little bit vulnerable as a person and just kind of hopefully trusting the the people and the, and the team around you to go yep yeah, cool i would suggest this or have you tried this or have you thought about this and oh i like that and then all of a sudden you become a better person for it yeah it's a joint it's a joint effort you're all in it together and I'm- like you say, I think the biggest bit, if I was going to give advice to any young coach, <laughs> yeah, I'm only young myself, but any advice to someone that co- wants to get into coaching is just be your coach. Don't try and be someone else. Like I watched Dex and he was fantastic. And for a while I thought I need to try and emulate that style. I need to try and be like him. But the reality of it is that's not me as a person and someone would see through that straight away. All I just, you just got to try and put yourself across to the group. And hopefully it's it's worked this year in, in that I've just, just tried to be my natural self with people. And if people don't like that, and I'd like to think that people could have on face value, just say, look, I don't like it for that reason. And I'm, I'd like to think I'm not the sort of person that comes across in a way that you're like, well, if you don't like the way I am, then stuff for you sort of thing. I'm actually quite open to, to why, what's not working for you in this situation. And in the same way, I'd like to think players would say that I'd be able to challenge players in that way. Why, why are you not learning from this method? Is it is it potentially how I'm coming across? Um, but like, I've, I've been that well on a bit longer that chat, but it's very fascinating to see what you guys all think makes a good coach and and what's worked for you. The last two questions from me, guys, because I'm where where it's gone for a little while, and you probably got probably got stuff to do in these times. Oh, uh, I've so uh, many plans. <laughs> so many plans. I've got. I'm four so <laughs> yeah, but I had a full English this morning, so my fitness routine's going through. That's the worst thing. You go, you go shopping, like, well, for me on a personal level, you go shopping once a week and you, you store up and you try and do everything, you know, government is telling you, you know, don't overstock and all this. I bring it into my house and then I just eat it. <laughs> I, just eat, I just eat within two well, days. What else are you going to do with it? <laughs> Make a shine around well, it. I mean, I, I'm eating twice the amount as I normally would. I've never Wait. once sat down and gone, oh, I think I should eat two packs of Jaffa cakes and a packet of Twiglets right now. I'm, like, Thank you. I'm gonna do this. But the less you do, the more you eat. I've noticed yeah, I, whenever I sit indoors to work from home, I eat double the amount I would if I was actually out doing stuff. Because you just don't you have nothing you're bored. So you're like, what do I do? Eat. It's a dangerous place to be. But um girls I w we've spoken a bit a little bit about the way the game's going and, and how much has changed in the game. What are your thoughts on where the game's going, what are you thinking of, of all the changes and is it exciting is it, would you say it's an exciting time to be involved in the game? Yeah, it's really exciting. I mean, I hope we get to sort of play the 100 because that is sort of the next big thing for women being on the same platform as men. Um, And I mean, I was very excited to be involved. And I think the whole um, advertisement of it and the whole sort of aura about it would would be amazing. So I just hope that happens. But I mean, if you're a female cricketer at the moment, it is only positive. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting. Mm. Yeah, the same as Tasha. Really. I think, um, I, I again, I hope that the hundred does go ahead. Obviously, it may there may be different um, things to it that we may not be able to have overseas come over purely because of what's happening in the world and stuff. But if that happens, it gives more chance for more domestic um, cricketers to show people what they're made of, and it may be someone that 
you might not have they might not have been in the squad when we could have that overseas but they could come up turn up and absolutely show up and people will be like oh all right I probably should have put her in the squad originally like so <laughs> it does give people that opportunity and I think what they what we were doing with the women's county season as well obviously with the t20s like how all the counties sort of worked really hard and pushed for that was really good because I think if it was just the season where it was just sort of the hundred that was coming into place uh, we've worked so hard to get it going this and then I think it would just sort of start because I don't think you can stop I don't think county season should have been stopped full stop at all I think there should have still been the county season we managed to do it alongside the Super League mm. the last four years so it's just sort of finding that balance obviously this was going to be the first season of it and it's quite frustrating that majority of the season is going to be missed I believe but yeah I think and anyone being involved in women's cricket, no matter what age you're in, it's really exciting times. It's only going to sort of go up from where it is now. The, my, the biggest frustration, I've, I think you probably, girls will probably echo this, is the fact that you work so hard during the winter mm-hmm. and yet the window of opportunity to play is so short. And, and by, they've extended it with 100, which is brilliant, but it's, it's having to come at the expense of something else. Like, why can't we have a long cricket in summer? With access, with, with for, for yourself, access to as many games as possible. Because my criticism, my argument for younger girls is that they're not getting anywhere near the sort of level of cricket that boys are getting. And this is, we talk about understanding the game and, and developing themselves as players in the game. They need to play the game to do that. And at the moment, the provision's not there. So whilst the 100 is going to be fantastic, it's, it's brilliant, like Faz says, they're putting cricket on the map at that level for, for the women. I also think it, 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 we need to make sure we've got enough sustainability underneath that. And that Kent cricket layer is so important. I mean, obviously winning the league last year. Well done, girls. Um, but yeah, it, it's <laughs> up the horses. But the the sense of togetherness, that the, 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 that's a special feeling that, that the squad has. To even be involved slightly in that was amazing. And you think that that might be lost now, all because of the the advancement of the game. The game's being taken forward, but then we're also stripping back some layers of it. And it's, it's we want to get to a time with the game where it's inclusive, but it's also got a clear and coherent pathway that provides cricket for as many people as possible. I think, anyway. Very um, profound. I, I've never I've never been this deep before. It's a weird place to be in my mind. Is, is uh, You can tell I'm bored when I start going into really clear and coherent points like that and not just waffling, but there I go now. Um, yeah, I think the last question I've got to ask, Buzz, have you got any other questions you want to find out before I ask? Um, my, last my, my biggest thing is just that that big transition of where minor counties cricket is now, obviously that that kind of chapter is done with women's cricket and it's and it's developing more into the franchise stuff. <laughs> you know, is that pathway, is, is that leap, or, or almost like cutting off a, a specific chunk of where where women's development has been? Do you reckon that's going to have a detrimental effect in the short term game? versus what the what the advantages are going to be in the long term i think yeah i I understand what you're saying but i think what what i get worried about is that if they do if they did completely get rid of sort of like the women's county sides Mm. and i know from from age group under 17 they go in there's like the rdc's and then obviously there's going to be these um center of excellences and regional stuff but there's women who are a bit older that will then they might be a bit too old to get into the rdc's and the things so they will have no cricket other than club and club level in england isn't if you're wanting to push to be be international to be sort of the highest domestic women's club level is is not where you need to be at at this moment in time like it's not a layer of the pathway it may get it may get better because we've got more people coming through but at this moment, a 28-year-old who's played for Kent for over 10 years, yeah. playing women's club level against a 14-year-old who's just getting into Kent, sort of under 15 level, like, isn't going to challenge them enough. And I think that's, yeah. that's where they need to find someone. If they are going to get rid of the sort of women's side of the county stuff, they need to find something to sort of replace it with yeah. so we don't then lose people like that because... The likes of older people, like I think, obviously, England-wise, the team's sort of been quite set, and they are England are really good at sort of bringing their young guns up, which I love. And you have a set team, but like if you look at like Australia, like Sarah Ailey made her international debut, and I think she was 29. 
yeah. or something like that, 28, 29, yeah. making that international debut because of all the work that she's done state-wise, which is what our sort of level of county is, has been rewarded because she's just so consistent. And I think there still needs to be something in place to then be able to reward them sort of players. Yeah, yeah it's, almost, it's, it's almost like bottlenecking. The, the, that that system you can have a massive chunk of players and like I said in terms of the w- without a doubt the 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 long uh, the bigger picture or you know in, in five ten years time you know we're going to see a huge improvement and a huge push through of talented girls that I I don't think can be questioned the fact is there is going to be a big chunk of women and I, I say women not girls because it is going to be you know women in, from 22 to 28 who potentially are now out of those sort of age groups out of those pathways out of those development programs where they're going to think right well actually i'm just not going to play you know because they they're they're going to almost be thrust into a an environment that's so different to them and you've got to include the fact that there's going to be other things in life at that age that come with it you know there's you know when you're when we all know it as a young as young people you know mortgage jobs things like that all of a sudden if that's if that aspect's taken away that other things become more important potentially and i just i just fear that we're, we're going to potentially lose some some talent from, from this initial you know decision but i, I you know I, is that decision been completely final yet is that been no it's no, not it's not no. final so i think it's ongoing it's ongoing i think it's um yeah, it's it's ongoing. I just think there needs to be three levels. You like you need to have a good recreation, or you need to have a good sort of striving to be professional, and then you need to have a professional layer. So I, I, I yeah, I think it's very hard to sort of comment. I I do think they they will try and keep county because it has been so amazing and the work that volunteers have done and stuff. But yeah, it's hard to comment really because. Um, we yeah, really don't know for certain. There's yeah. so much uncertainty, like you say. But like you say, Fezzer, the point remains that it be it, it, the game needs those at least three layers of, of adult senior cricket to create the pathway. Because otherwise, that churn that is going to happen, we like it or lump it, you go from a, profes- a, a professional training programme during the winter, maybe potentially with Kent, where we're trying to put as much investment into the players as possible, and you come at the end of it and the only offering you've got is women's club cricket, That, that the two don't go into one. You yeah. need something that gives them that outlet. Um, final point for me then, girls. I always try and end the episodes for all 17 people that are still here um, to say what if you had one bit of advice that you that you've been given that sticks with you, one someone something someone said to you that you would that you say you you probably stuck with you the most, resonated with you the most. What would it be? Um, mine would be hard work has always come out on top. That would be mine. But yeah. that's yeah, it really rings true with me. So yeah. That's a really good point. No, really good point. Good. Mine's more <laughs> so it's like a quote. I think I got told it, but um when I think Winston Churchill might have said it. Oh, I was banking on two pack. And it it <laughs> success is not final, failure is not fatal, but it's the courage to continue that really matters. Oh. That's strong. Oh, yeah. I've got a space on the body for that one. I'm <laughs> I that got told that and that literally, I got told that during all sort of rehab of one of my many injuries, and it really sort of resonated with me that I was just like, you know what? Yeah, I have been successful, but that doesn't mean that I can't push on. And this injury isn't going to be like the end of what I am. And I think people need to sort of like, it is things like maybe in age groups they might not have got up into the next level age group but you work hard and you come back the next season and you prove them wrong you make them say you make them give them a reason not to say no to you yeah yeah Which i love I, that yeah i love that thinking and that line of thought about what is your ceiling what is your success you always push for it don't not back sir they like say not backs are only part of the path to where you need to be but girls, thank you so much for taking the time to come yeah, on and, and speak with us. Right. I know I've, I've, I've learned even more than I thought I would. Um, well, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, have a little emotional cry after that quote, Grace. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna have to go and have a little yeah. emotional cry after that quote. It is, it's very, it's a very deep quote, but it's always stuck in my head. 
No. I genuinely, I'm just working out an idea of getting that toad onto me somewhere. I don't know where I'd get <laughs> it. Maybe oh, it's got to be on the ribs, isn't it? So got that yeah, out. a big long one. <laughs> I've got, I've got, I've got plenty of room still. So yeah, maybe, maybe on the side, I'll, I'll go down there. But no, yeah, thank you so much for your input today. It's been thoroughly enjoyable to sit and chat. 